Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Gary DeMar and the American Vision have now partnered with the Canon app. Download and subscribe today as we build out the best platform for Christian content on the market. So welcome to the podcast. This is episode 184. I'm Douglas Wilson. Thank you for joining me. It's good to have you here. And if you've been with us from the beginning, thank you for doing that. This has been a long, long haul, hasn't it? So here in this episode of the podcast, I want to talk about judging Christian leaders from a distance, judging Christian leaders from a distance. And I want to distinguish between what you might describe as barbershop conversation. This is what I think the president ought to do, you know, in the Middle East. So you got two or three guys waiting in a barbershop to get their hair cut and the barber, and they are tackling the problem of peace in the Middle East. That is part of what it means to be a citizen, what it, what it means to be aware of your surroundings, what it means to be a part of a nation and so forth. You watch what's going down and you have opinions, right? The problem that I see is not that Okay, we went to war and a thoughtful Christian who's read up on the thing doesn't think that this is a good occasion for war. Or you've got an intractable social situation that involves hundreds of thousands of people, let's say ethnic unrest and that sort of thing. Even there, you want to be well read. Even there, you want to be up on your facts. You don't want to be the kind of person who just wings it. You want to have your opinions be well informed. But I'm talking about something else, and I'm talking about something else particularly with regard to evaluating Christian leaders, presidents of seminaries, editors of publishing houses, editors of magazines, leaders of denominations, and so on, right? Now, such men can be evaluated on the basis of what they say. If they come out at a press conference and they say a bunch of unbiblical things, then you can critique them for saying unbiblical things. If they publish a book in which they argue for something stupid, you can respond with uh, a critique of whatever stupid thing they said. But there's a tendency I've seen in commentators online to comment not on the positions that are taken or even the trajectory that they see the, uh, the seminary or the denomination or the publishing house going, but rather to comment on uh, the palace intrigues that led up to this decision. And I think that that's where uh, oftentimes political commentators are out on thin ice. I have been in the middle of enough of um, institutional battles, institutional jockeying for position, people who want to uh, uh, do something that I think is really ill-advised. My son, Nate has a law. We really need to name it. But he says in any meeting, in any board meeting or committee meeting that lasts over 20 minutes, someone will propose something which, if implemented, will ruin everything. So in any meeting that goes over 20 minutes, someone will propose something which, if implemented, will ruin everything. And while I wouldn't want to press that into the corners, I think there's a great deal to it. So as P.G. Woodhouse said, somebody, when you're looking at an organization, somebody is always up to something, and the rest of them are up to something else. So here's the situation. Let's say a publishing house publishes a book that argues for abortion in certain limited cases. Let's say rape, incest, you know, something that, that shows that the author of the book and the editor of the book didn't understand what the right to life issue was. If you make exceptions for rape and incest, you're saying when the parents commit a crime, it's all right to execute the child who had nothing to do with the crime. If the criminal is the rapist, is the father, then we execute the child for the crime of the father. If um, there's a consensual relationship between brother and sister and the sister gets pregnant, then we execute the child for the sin and crime of the father and mother. Anybody who argues for that doesn't understand the pro-life issue at all, right? But let's say a book is published with that argued. Now, you know, just glance, all you have to do is look at the spine and see 
who published it. And then you need to look up who the editor is and know who's responsible for publishing it. But what you don't know before, before you start calling for that editor's head and, and pronouncing on how he is, um, he's on the slippery slope to damnation, what you don't know is all the skullduggery that led up to this book being published. You don't know if the editor is getting counsel from his pastor and elders on when he should leave the uh, publishing house, when he should offer his resignation, under what circumstances is he trying to re- offer his resignation. Is he waiting for six months from now, there's going to be a meeting of a broader board where he thinks this can be reversed, et cetera. Basically, a lot of these situations, when we're dealing with palace intrigue, you are looking at a water polo game, and a lot of the action is under the surface of the water where you can't see it. So if a person who, in a position of responsibility, if that editor, if the publisher comes out and defends the book that he published and says, no, no, this is right this is a good argument, then you can say, man, he's, gone, he's, he's going south. It's not just the publishing house going south. He is too. Remember David and Joab. Uh, remember David and Joab. David really objected to some of Joab's behavior. And to speak fairly, Joab sometimes objected to David's behavior and was right also on, this, on the matter of the census and not coming out to greet the troops after the defeat of Absalom. But Joab was a bare knuckle fighter and was guilty of murder and in a flagrant sort of way. And David wanted Joab dealt with, but David didn't have the resources to deal with him. And so he left the task to his son. But David was not, David perhaps should have had the resources to deal with Joab. And perhaps part of the reason he didn't was because Joab knew where a few of the bodies were buried. Remember, Joab was. Uh, David's instrument for dealing with Uriah, the Hittite, uh, Bathsheba's husband, and and so on. So maybe uh, he couldn't deal with Joab because Joab had dirt on him, or what? You know, we we don't know. But the point is that we we know that David wanted to, and there are many situations where we say why, from a distance, why doesn't so and so tangled up in this uh, palace intrigue? Why doesn't this person do thus and such? Well, it's awfully hard to know what to do in the middle of a situation like that, much less from uh, when you're evaluating it from across the country. So those are a few things we should keep in mind when we're evaluating Christian leaders from a distance. So continuing with the podcast, episode 184, uh, last week we looked at the word for fear, and this session we're going to consider the verb form of the same word. This homarteological word is Deliao, deliao, meaning to be afraid. To be afraid. This comes up once in Scripture. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the Lord Jesus teaches us the nature of this sin of being afraid through what he contrasts it to and what he says might accompany it. The contrast is with peace and not a worldly peace either. It's a peace left with us by Christ himself. So Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. So I'm giving you a particular kind of peace, uh, not the kind of peace the world gives. And this peace that I give to you is what contrasts with being afraid. All right. So he then says that we're not to let our hearts be troubled and we are, we are not to let our hearts be afraid. Whatever it is, it's the kind of thing that is the opposite of a God-given peace. And it goes along with heart upheavals, heart troubles. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. And make sure you're walking in peace. And so the Lord speaks a requirement to us. And it is a comforting word at the same time. So continuing with podcast episode 184, the book I would like to review this time around is an audio book by Joe Rigney, the incoming president at Bethlehem uh, College and, and Seminary. And this book is called More Than a Battle, More Than a Battle. I'm not sure if it's available in other formats other than audio, but uh, I listened to it on audio and it might just be an audio book and that's all. But it's a, it's a worthwhile read, More Than a Battle. And it is a, uh, it's a book that, that is um, seeking to help men in their uh, fight against 
pornography. Joe is very careful to uh, lay a theological groundwork for this battle. It's not a Christian man who wants to successfully mortify his lusts needs something more than simply saying, oh, lust is bad or porn use is bad. I need to stop doing it and I'm going to grit my teeth and try harder. That does not work. It simply does not work. The law does not give power to keep the law. The law does not grant power to keep the law before you're saved, and the law does not give power, grant power to keep the law after you're saved. The law is like a speed limit sign by the, by the highway. That speed limit sign has no connection to your accelerator. You're in the car, and the, the speed limit sign gives you information and a resultant condemnation or well done, depending on how fast you're driving. But the speed limit sign doesn't have any actual control over the speed of the car. All those decisions are made inside the car. So there's got to be a theological framework, understanding the gospel, understanding the position we're in, understanding our, uh, what's the Bible teach about our bodies, our fallen state. What does the Bible teach about all of these things? And Rigney does a good job uh, laying the groundwork for that. And then he moves into some very practical things that you can do to um, fight and conquer this sin. Now, those Christian men who have an ongoing struggle with this sin and temptation are men who, uh, if they've said, well, I've, I've read a book on fighting porn uh, use before and it didn't do any good. Well, I would say if, you are, if you're still defeated by this, even if it's just periodically defeated by it, my advice to you is, well, read another one then and read another one then. Read another one. You, uh, clearly, this is a significant part of your sanctification or lack of it. And so, consequently, you ought to be paying more attention to it. If you're flunking a particular course in school, that is the course that you should be paying the most attention to. You should be cracking open the books for that course far more frequently than the, uh, the other ones that you, are, that you have a better handle on. But too many Christians uh, want to study for the courses they're already passing or the courses that they're naturally good at, and they ought to be uh, giving themselves to a study of those things that they are not naturally good at. So more than a battle uh, is Joe Rigney's um, book on dealing with lust and pornography, and uh, I commend it to you. It's a good book. Have at it. Read it. And if you, if you need more help, read it again. If you need more help, read another one. Keep after it. Mm-hmm. 